<laughs> I'm putting uh, putting new can you uh, try to babies in. Can you try to pull it? Oh no! I, I actually it's down there on purpose. I just kind of forgot about it, it uh, for the purposes of this. I um, I'm putting in new wireless APs. Oh, and looks like we're live. Uh, we're just sitting here chatting about stuff. Good morning, fellow nerds, and welcome to another episode of Between Two Nerds. I'm Jeff Doyle, and with me, as always, is my friend and co-host Jeff Tansura. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, Jeff. Great to see you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to everybody who's listening to us. Yeah, and Happy New Year. And with us uh, is our uh, apparent, apparently permanent guest, uh, <laughs> Russ White. We're, we we have so much fun the three of us together on these sessions that we just uh, we we can't let go of you. Um, you know, there's guests who come to visit you and then move in. <laughs> <laughs> My mom has a sign that says, fish and in-laws stink after three days. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Old Mark Twain quote. That's great. Uh, yeah. So we're we're going to to wrap up. We've done, I think this is if I if I remember right, this is our fifth session talking about nav navigating network complexity. Um and it's from uh Russ and Jeff's book on navigating network complexity and uh, something I, I think I've said it most every session, but it's one of my favorite books. Uh, it's, it's worth reading. It's, it is networking basics, but it's a completely different perspective on networking basics. And so whether you are new to networking or whether you're an experienced networker, it's a book that I, that I very much recommend reading. Um, and you know, as the name implies, it uh, the the entire book deals with complexity in networking. And uh, just looking through here, um, uh, you know, we we've talked, you know, we defined complexity. Uh, we talked about measuring network complexity, different components of complexity, um, and then complexity in design. I believe we talked a little bit about operations. Um, and you have practical uh, chapters after that. I'm, I'm just actually look, looking at the at the tab table of content here. Uh, uh, complexity in protocols, uh, um, uh, programmable network works, um, and uh, service vir virtualization, service chaining, complexity in, uh, um, well, I already said virtualization, complexity in the cloud. And I... I think we could probably do, do an entire session on any one of one of the topics, but uh, where, where we really wanted uh, to go, go is just sort of wrap, wrap all this up. And so I've jumped over to uh, uh, last chapter um, in, in the book. I, I reviewed it again this morning just to, uh, to remind, remind myself how you guys wrapped everything, everything up. Um, and, uh, uh, I don't know, it sounds like maybe you're, you're nervous, nervous about questions I might spring on you because you're, you guys are very quiet, quiet. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> There's no question I, I could pose that you guys, so, so what you guys, if not both could not, not answer. So, so not not too worried about but uh but but just being at the end of the end of the book here i mean it's uh, the in the last chapter you you wrap wrap up by sort of redefining uh complexity and and, and you have three uh topic six there which are, are um you know complexity means that the system is difficult to understand uh it has unintended consequences and there are a, a large number of interesting parts do you you uh, do you still agree with that? Yep. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I I I think that the internet has become nothing but more complex over time. Personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, um, kind of a kind of a whole different topic. Uh, before we started started the show, talking about that, um, um, I've been helping a helping a, helping a young get into IT. Uh, just providing advice, advice and direction, and and that sort of thing. And 
as a part of that, I was thinking back to when, when I went into IT and first started learning. And, and, uh, and even when I got my, got my CCIE, I think things was a whole lot easier than getting, getting a CIE or a quiv, quiv certification today, uh, simply because there's so much more to know. Um, you know, and, and these days, engineers almost have to be specialized in, 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 in because, because there's so, so much to know. But anyway, I want to read you a quote on, on the first part on difficult to understand. Uh, something I, I highlight in your book. It says, it says, one of the most difficult problems to solve in the world of design is belief that complex things are simple leading to an insufficient level of attention being paid to the complexity that, that is really there. There, um, Care to comment on that? Yeah, so I think what we see is networking industry goes in around between centralization, decentralization, mm -hmm. right? And centralization usually ignores the fact that when you centralize complexity, it becomes unmanageable, right? We've seen open flow failing miserably. We've seen kind of very centralized systems that try to manage everything failing really miserably because of our complexity and just inability to do things at scale, right? When we fully decentralize, we've seen the complexity because of amount of state, because of kind of all the surfaces that interact with each other, right? IGP on top of BGP, sorry, all around, underlay on top of below, overlay, overlay on top, and another set of overlay on top of it. So while the idea was to decouple the main, and then they all interact with each other, right? If you don't have reachability and underlay, your overlay doesn't work, right? Yeah. So finding the golden middle is still kind of where we are seeing this to try and to, it's a noble goal, but we are still not there. Yeah, I was actually reading a book on complexity and biological systems, as crazy as that is, um, and signaling in biological systems, which is kind of another little odd thing that I get involved with from time to time. I probably shouldn't, but there it is. And, you know, they were talking about something called the spiral of... Um, how they they call it? They called it the spiral of complexity. Like things get so complex that they eventually just collapse in their own complexity, yeah. and there's just no way to get out of you know having that type of problem. And I think we see not so much of that in the IT world right now because we aren't. I mean, because we just can't build things that are that complex, but. As we build, well, actually, I don't know. I, I should take that back because I should say that for me, it seems like every network failure I've ever dealt with is some kind of spiral of complexity failure. You know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I was, I was with this definition and, and listening to what you guys were saying here. And what, what kind of popped into my head is the famous uh, uh, quote from Einstein um, about... about uh, you know, uh, you do not understand something sufficiently. You can't explain it to a five-year-old, um, and that's almost most contradict. Uh, uh, and maybe it does doesn't. Uh, it seems to contradict what we've been saying here. You know, though that that um, um, that that we. I'm not going to say. Well, just just from uh, from the quote here, you know that uh, um, for the problem is is not thinking of a, of a complex system in in its full city. Is that a uh, trying to make things too simple? Well, no, I don't know. I mean, I think that's right. I think if you if you can't explain it to a five year old, you you don't really understand it. But perhaps when you get in that position, what you're running into is not just um, that you can't explain it to a five-year-old because you're not good enough at explaining things. It's as much as well that the system is too complex to be explained uh, in a way that the average human mind can grasp it. And maybe that's when you've reached the point of having too much complexity. Yeah. yeah. So um, 
that it, and, and it's because it's, uh, you use the um, the phrase too much too much complexity, which is actually the very next sec section uh, uh, in the chapter uh, where I where I did a couple of things of what makes something too complex. Uh, and you've actually got four bullet points. I won't read the complete bullet points, but, but uh, summarizing here, um, you know, as far as uh, uh, a system that involves the pro problem is more than more than like too complex. Uh, if the cost of maintaining the system overwhelms the co cost, maybe this is more about solutions. Uh, the cost of maintaining, maintaining the system overwhelms the cost of simply dealing dealing with them in the first place. Um, I, I really, really that point. Um, I think it's something that, uh, for in years, we, we, we get obsessed with what is the solution for, or something to the point of is, is the problem itself, um, the con consequence is the problem, not as Im impactful as the solution to the pro problem. Um, and you know, just going to the other bullet bullet points here, they're somewhat related. The complexity of real, real resulting system is worse than the complexity of, of simply working around the problem. Uh, the mean time to failure is, um, or uh, mean time to repair, is is so uh, the users of the system end, end up having no way to address, address the problem. Uh, and insertion of, of repair changes just causes a large number of unintended consequences. And that, that you know, kind of goes back to uh, um, part of the second condition. But, but uh, um, that's something that, that I've been reading on, on um, uh, several diff different, on several different planes, I guess, um, of... You know, sometimes we do get so obsessed with uh, solving a problem that the solution is worse, worse than the problem itself. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, in uh, more generic terms, we lose the forest behind the trees, right? We are trying yeah. to implement one more thing, another thing on top of it, and finally the solution becomes more complex than the initial issue. That potentially was reasonably simple and reasonably simple to compartmentalize and, you know, just have it in its own box when it doesn't affect anything else. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think part of this too is that we lose the thread between local optimization and global optimization, that we, we locally optimize to the point, but every time we locally optimize something, we're actually making the overall system more complex. And the more we globally optimize something, the more we're driving complexity into the individual components. And so, you know, we don't rethink when we go through and we do things, we don't rethink like, as we would call it in the coding world, we don't refactor. We don't, we don't sit down and redesign everything from the ground up with the new, the new complexities and the new realities in tow. We just keep adding and we keep optimizing locally, optimizing locally without ever thinking about what the complexity of the overall system is. Oh, look, the vice president's voicemail isn't working. Let's go fix the voicemail. Yeah, you do that 100 times for 100 vice presidents and your network is a big mass of rules designed just for the vice president. You know, and it's just, it's just messy after a while. Yeah, I think translating what Russ said into technology, uh, there's still some echo now everywhere. So anyway, if we look at RCPT, that was pretty much local optimization. So every headend would do its local computation and uh, probably use some uh, LSPs, and they would be right from this not perspective, but potentially make overall state of the network worse. Right, we've seen this all over the place with RSPT, and uh, so some people move to centralized controllers and actually move from RSPT to segment routing, made moving towards controller architecture mandatory because segment routing doesn't have ability to signal, doesn't have any state associated with the network. Right, it's completely stateless in this perspective. So someone else on behalf should be computing the process. So now suddenly everything is centralized. So while 
in fully distributed computation mode. We had issue of uh, underutilization. We had a lot of issues with auto mesh configurations and computations, right? So they were local. They only affected local nodes. Now we move to completely centralized model in which if you don't get enough data, your data is stale, suddenly you are affecting all of your network. So the effect of centralization, actually the plus radius as the effect of centralization has become much more significant. So if something breaks, it breaks at scale and the end result is often really catastrophic. Yeah. I mean, to even give a decentralized example, Andrew Austin's been talking a lot about the problem with security and SRV6 header compression. And this is just one of those things where we've really, I mean, SRV6 is, a, is in my mind, what kind of what traffic engineering should have been in the first place in many ways. I mean, it's much simpler SR, I shouldn't say SRV6 specifically, but SR in general um, is a much simpler way. You're, you're, you're better distributing the state between what's inside the network and what's outside the network to some degree. Maybe SR pushes too much state to the edge, whereas traditional traffic engineering pushes too much into the network. I don't know, but you know, it's just basically a rejiggering of where that state lives. But then what happens is you build up so much state at the edge that you have to start trying to compress that state. But when you compress the state and try to make it backward compatible, you end up with all of these outlying problems, these things like security that just weren't obvious when you were working on that one little local optimization of fixing, you know, first of all, you're trying to fix traffic engineering. So you fix that. And then, well, the header size is really big. I need to go fix that. So you go fix that. But these little local optimizations are causing this total global mess um, or potentially a global mess that you just, um, I don't know. I've talked about Keith's law before. I think that Keith's law plays a role in this is that, you know, this, this, this yeah. idea of what you see versus what you don't see type of a thing. And I think evolution of LBP is a very, very good example of that. So remember when we just kind of design LBP and start to deploy it in order to be able to use LSP, that's LDP signals, you had to have exact match. In other words, less 32, right? Your fact is what's, what's needed, same route in order to actually install label pass and forwarding. So it worked at small scale because you don't summarize, right? When we started thinking about larger network, think of similar thing to less architecture where you have multi-area multi-level, potentially multi-domain network, suddenly you cannot build it anymore unless you summarize on boundaries. And this is why we created, why we built or designed IGPs to be hierarchical, give the ability to summarize on boundaries. Suddenly LDP stopped working because now you are not getting exact match to effect. You are getting only summary, which required rework, another RFC, long process, and changes on all vendors to be able to resolve over shorter route, right? So it shows you kind of evolution of protocols from being in a mode, let's abstract everything, let's aggregate, and we know it's small enough so we can still afford to have exact match for every route, till network started to evolve more endpoints, more routes, and suddenly we couldn't do it without aggregation. So you see this evolution from very simple but low scale into larger and suddenly at large scale things don't work we envision right so something got to give so in this case we were able to create another technology but sometimes you need to rethink whole architecture yeah absolutely i, I you know for myself i was, I was I, as, as we were talking about this and then uh and by the way, uh, I'm told to, I can't hear it, but I'm, but I'm told that a lot of distortion and echo on, on mind of of, the, of this thing sort of staying muted. I don't have any, anything to say, so uh, uh, I apologize to everybody in the in the um, everybody listening that's probably hearing a lot of noise right now. But but uh, you know, for me, sort of a different aspect of of, of uh, 
complexity and unintended consequences uh, back into the 1990s, early 2000s, was really heavily involved in um, IPv6 back, back when everybody was still saying, you know, ah, IPv6 never happened. Um, but there are probably dozens of tr transition technologies. Uh, IPv4 to IPv6 that were being proposed, and some of them were absurdly complex. And no one, no one, uh, I don't want no one, but uh, but many did not seem to be uh, acknowledging uh, the impact that the complexity of the, the solution having uh, that was actually driving people away from um, being interested in, in adopting IPv6 because, uh, uh, you know, again, the solution was, was worse the problem. Yeah. So so I actually have another take on IPv6 transition that, that I just ran into kind of yesterday or the day before that relates to complexity. When we talk about a solution for complexity. One thing we talk about, and by the way, I ran into this again, reading this biological systems book, and they were talking about how there's a bow tie effect, which is exactly the same thing as the wasp waste that we talk about in the book, that there's a bow tie, that there's this fan out on one side of complex things, and there's a kind of a central core that doesn't ever change, and then you have a fan out on the other side. And, um, you know, this is this is just a scale-free network. That's what this is. This is how a scale-free network works. You have a core that rarely ever changes. Well, one thing that occurred to me about the IPv6 is, is that it's much easier to change things out on that fanny parts, out on those parts, out on the edges, than it is that central bow tie knot or the part in the wasp waist. And so I think a lot of what we did when we did V6 is we didn't think through the complexity of V6 itself and the transition mechanisms in building V6 against, like we thought, it's like BGP. I can switch BGP to another protocol, right? I mean, it's a protocol. I can just replace it. It's not that simple because this is the core of the scale-free network that is the internet. And so you're trying to change the knot in the bow tie and doing that necessarily pulls at all the strings all the way through the whole system. And so this is something we don't think about a lot in the complexity world or in the network world is that it's not just the, the sheer complexity. It's also what is the structure of the system we're looking at and what part of the strings are we pulling on? That seems to be a big thing to me. Yeah. And when you start, I mean, I'm relieving the complexity in the book on daily basis, right? I'm, I can't talk about exact numbers, but we have today between four to six million individual links in the network. Think about the number, right? So unless you go and compartmentalize, unless you can ensure the changes in one place don't affect other places, it's absolutely unmanageable. You cannot create enough if-else rules in your uh, maintenance window to just make sure that you are not breaking anything, right? So making things simpler in smaller blocks, making sure that they don't directly interact with each other. So we talk about summarization, right? Very simple topic, but pretty much the only way to hide changes in IP topology in any given place, right? So bu building the smaller blocks allows us to better understand them because they're exactly the same. That's the only way to scale, right? You just replicate them your NNI or interconnectivity model between those blocks is exactly the same. So you understand it well because you don't build snowflake. If you do, it breaks again. So it makes you think very differently in a way. You start thinking about replicability, reducing uh, amount of variability in how you build things and common connectivity model. And... <sighs> I, I said I've probably mentioned this before, um, uh, related to what you said. Um, you know, a book that I that I definitely enjoy, and there's 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 a movie too. It's The Martian, um, and the whole the whole. Book, I always say that's it's an engineering. Uh, uh, it's a book written for engineers <laughs> because uh, because the whole uh, premise of the book is that there's there's this, this enormous insurmountable problem. And that insurmountable problem is, is eventually solved by the end of the book. And, you know, the, the, uh, most people listening probably know the story of the Martian. You know, it's, you know, it's a guy that 
uh, an astronaut that inadvertently has landed on Mars, on Mars so with no way to communicate, and uh, and uh, how does he survive until somebody has he has to come back to rescue him? And how does he even let people know that he's there um, when they they think he's dead? Uh, and, and, but the the the, um, the solution of insurmountable problem is to break the one big problem down into small solvable pieces and you just solve one piece after another until until you until you finally solve uh, the unsolved unsolvable problem um and like i said i've i've, I've probably seen that before but, but um yeah i think, think that taking that huge fictional example and and applying it to, to networking uh, makes make sense, you know, that if you look at something that, that is enormously complex, you can break it down into smaller solvable pieces. It, it, uh, um, suddenly, maybe it's not, it's not so complex. Does that make sense? Yeah. That, something I'm reading this book called The Switch right now, which is which is actually a pretty good book. And um, I, I shouldn't say that too loud. Mike Bouchon might be listening to this and say, pretty good book? What are you talking about? But anyway... <laughs> Um, I'm actually reading it on Bouchon's, on Bouchon's re recommendation, but he says that our analytical mind tends to see a 24 inch hole and goes looking for a 24 inch peg to stick in that 24 inch round hole. And we don't realize that sometimes the only way, or most of the time, actually, the only way to really fill a 24 inch round hole is with a bunch of little one inch dowels. And it might take 20 or 30 of them, but Sometimes you've got to do small things instead of trying to fix the big thing. You just got to look at it and say, but yeah, great. Um, might be true, but not really useful. Um, or or um, how does he put it? TBU, true, but but uh, not, not useful in some way. And so, yeah, I mean, sometimes the problem might be true, but hey. And I think the other thing that's interesting is, is when we deal with these problems, we tend to focus on the problem and think about what's broken rather than thinking about what has worked before. And this is something that knowing the history of the protocols and being able to analyze the protocols at a, not just a, oh, these are the bits that do this, but why they do that, where I find the RENA model really helpful personally, or the RINA model or however you want to call it, um, is in understanding like what has worked before not just from an individual bit perspective, but from a theoretical perspective. Okay, we have micro loops in our link state protocol. What solutions have ever been tried to solve micro loops? What were the problems that people ran into trying to deploy those solutions? Now I have like a mental model, I have like a guide that helps me navigate a space instead of just looking at a problem and going, oh, well, you know, this is a problem. I'm just going to invent stuff to make it better. And by the way, it's a 24 inch hole problem. So I'm going to invent a 24 inch dowel to stick into that hole. You know, it's, it's, it, it's much more helpful. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we, especially in ITF, you see kind of people coming outside of ITF and proposing things that probably don't work, but were dismissed because they didn't work. We had proof that they didn't work. But still, every three, four years, kind of, I mean, I wouldn't call them crazy. They're more naive than crazy. Proposals come up, take people's energy time rather than, you know, know, you, know your stuff. If you're working on something, read your history, know what people did before you. Right? It's very, very well to rough point. There's very few new things in the world. Most of the things are coming back every cycle. Right, so rather than trying to re reinvent fifth wheel, perhaps it's better to look how you improve your four existing wheels. Well, and kind of going to um, uh, to, to Russ's example of um, you know, be the best way to get a 24 inch range hole is the tour one inch dowels, and 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 maybe you have 24 one inch dowels, but uh, you have 20, and is that uh, um, you know. Is that, that at least better than, than not filling a hole at all? At all is actually filling it, and um, you know, kind of getting away from from uh, <laughs> from from, from analogy speak here. But uh, you know, you know, often is 
is that it may be less important to completely solve a problem as it is to just alleviate a problem. Uh, maybe thinking in terms of micro loops, so, uh, you know, I recall that is maybe doesn't solve micro loops, but is, is less pro micro loops. Yeah, because at some point micro loop becomes non problem if no one can notice if it doesn't affect your business, if it doesn't affect really your customers, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or you can just switch to EDGE RP. Hey, I have to tell this. <laughs> Sorry, I hope this isn't uh, uh, railing uh, the, the arc of our discussion here, but the way that Russ and I first got to know, know each other, and I don't know if you even remember this, but, but uh, back in the 1990s, I was writing my, my first outing TCP IP book. Uh, Cisco was, was pretty guarded about how EIGRP worked, worked. And I you know, wanted, wanted to, obviously wanted to talk about, talk about it in the book, um, how EIG, EIGRP worked, and I was making a lot of, of um, 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 a lot of uh, inferences from, from the uh, the algorithm that it was based okay. on, the dual algorithm, and all that. And finally, somebody that I was working with at Cisco uh, said, um, um, "Here's this guy, guy knows EIGRP, and uh, uh, we decided we're going to kind of lift the veil and let you talk about, about all the details. And here's this, the guy can fill you in, and that was Russ White. And that, that's how long Russ, Russ have known each other and how we first got to know each other. Yeah, it's interesting. I, because... I should tell my story then, how I met Russ. <laughs> 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 clean this is a family audience you know <laughs> oh yeah so 2001 and i just replaced 7200 by 75 happy happy suddenly <laughs> my G G gp scanner hits 100 percent every 60 seconds so obviously i go to tuck and guess what <laughs> yep so i told her <laughs> hey man i just spent another half million dollar on you and it works worse not better so what's up? So we troubleshoot, we figure out that BGP was trying to resolve a uh, route over another BGP route and that drove the BGP scanner process crazy. So we resolved the issues, but Russ was as helpful as always, as knowledgeable as always. And we've known each other for 20 years now. Wow. So so what's really funny, Jeff Doyle, is that when they decided to lift EIGRP, part of the reason that EIGRP, Cisco didn't lift the curtains on EIGRP is because not many people knew how it worked. And the reason they didn't was because there was no good internal documentation. So what Don Slice and I did was we used GDB and we set breakpoints in the EIGRP code and we threw packets at it and we traced the code to figure out what it was actually doing. And so that is... <laughs> That hard way, uh, yeah. That's the the hard way. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just wonder if I if I scared so a little bit before they introduced me to you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because because like I said, I was uh, uh, guys named uh, JJ Acevedo Luna that uh, uh, created dual algorithm, and uh, you know I had re read his papers first, uh, and then was a little bit like what you're talking about just just playing with the igrp and making making all the deductions around okay this is how the how the algorithms is supposed to work work and, you know here's what i'm seeing uh yeah, so here at cisco so i said well if this lunatic is going to be talking about it we better better we better make sure he, he actually was what he's talking talking about yeah interesting so dean play just made a comment there spend four hours sharpening your axe and two hours cutting understand the topology draw it out run an insane amount of show commands before diving in yeah um and i would even go further than that and i would say not just the topology but i i have this common experience where i used to walk into customers all the time when i was on global escalation um, hasn't happened so much recently, but I well still rem well remember this happening and saying, okay, tell me about your network. And they take me into this conference room and in the side of the conference room, there would be this flip chart of printed and drawn material. And it would be like 10 or 15 or 20 pages. 
And they're these huge sheets of paper. I mean, they're drafting, not, I mean, they're beyond drafting paper size. I mean, I used to do drafting in high school and stuff. And, and so they had these huge pieces of paper on this big flip chart and they would say, well, here is the first part of the network. And it would show you all these physical wires and the connectivity and which port everything plugged into. And you flip to the next page and it would have all these lines saying continued from part one. And you're like all this stuff connected. I'm like, yeah, but, this doesn't tell me anything about the network. They're like, dude, this is the topology. This is the way the topology really works. This is down to the port level. Yeah, but the port level doesn't tell me anything about how routing works. Explain to me how this network converges. And I think we often miss, when we talk about abstraction and summarization, that there are layers of understanding a network at different ways as well that we need sometimes to walk out of the complexity of all the wiring and get into, well, most of the time and get into how the figure out how the thing converges before you start doing design work and changing things. Um, understand if I pull this link, what are the actual steps that are going to get me back to a quiescent state in this network? And I, I, I think we often miss that. Yeah. And, uh, after so many years working on the same stuff, you start making assumptions, right? And it's very difficult to take a step back, as you said, and actually look holistically at how does the thing converge? Steps it's taken from failure detection to failure solution, right? And this is probably the most important part. So working top down rather than bottom up makes you think more from an architectural perspective than all oh, this link failed probably i need to do something and that you know there, there was a uh, and again i i forgot probably brought up in a previous show i've i've forgotten that uh um, the whole idea of uh failure concept of failure is uh you know that there's a counterintuitive uh, idea that if if you're not if your if your network is not is not experiencing small failures, um, you're a lot more at risk and a lot more prone to a catastrophic failure. Uh, and so the um, you know the context of there is um, what's behind uh, things like like a chaos monkey and and uh, 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 Facebook's project Storm. You know where the start. With you know, somebody saying, "Well, what happens if we if we lose in our data center?" And and you know the, the, the thing came up when there was a hurricane in, uh, in, impending, and they had a data center at risk. I think like two data centers, and you know, and realizing, well, we can we can pre project on um, spreadsheets all day long on what might happen and and what we can cover or, or not. If we have a data center, data center go down, um, but the only real way to know is for the data data center to act fail. Uh, you know whether whether failover processes work and. and um, Maybe that's a really roundabout way way of uh, back to what you were saying, Jeff. Of um, you know that that you know that f f any figure is educational experience, but hopefully you're you're taking those in small doses. Eventually, things break down not where you expect them. If we look at last four months, we've seen huge outages on Amazon Cloud or some others. None of it was really BGP problem for Facebook. It was suggested, right? It was automation problem. On Amazon side of things, I believe it was problem of the NAT gateway. Again, I don't know. I'm just reading stuff, right? But practically, you don't know what's going to give up. At this scale, you really need to architecturally understand your narrow and potentially workarounds, right? And ideally, if you could test them before, Real failure actually happens. That's the best way to deal with it. But even if you don't, if you have architectural understanding of end-to-end -end system top down, you could design your system in a way any failure, at least single failure, could be worked around. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. And and I think that's again goes back to the concept of opaque boxes and aggregation it's a good idea to aggregate it's important to aggregate you can't scale without aggregation 
you know, scale-free networks are the only way to really scale in the real world. And that only happens through aggregation of information, whether it's topology or reachability or even virtualization, which is the same sort of a concept. Um, it's just another form of aggregation. APIs, all of that protocol layering, all of that is, is abstraction. And all that's great, but what abstraction basically comes down to is it means I don't need to understand the inner workings of this opaque box over here. Yeah. And yeah, great. That helps me scale. But when failure comes, I don't understand the inner workings of that opaque box over there. And I don't know how it's going to fail. And if I push in this spot, you know, it's like the, it's like the mythical story of the apocryphal story of the old guy who takes the hammer and starts beating up on the printing press or the generator or whatever it is in the various versions of the story. Right. And my favorite you know, story. Yeah, it's, it's not, well, how'd you know? How'd you know how hard to hit it? I didn't know anything about it. I just know where to hit it. I just know where to hit it because that's just, I know the system. It's the same thing. I mean, we don't really understand all of it and we can't, and ideally we shouldn't have to. Um, but that also means there's going to be uncertainty in the way things are going to fail because we don't know if I push that button or I take that hammer and hit it over here, we're not entirely certain what's happening inside that opaque box. And so that's just the way it works. You know, you just, it's just, I don't know. And I would really like to drive it back to my presentation, comfort, comfort to life, right? The larger your failure domain is, the more difficult is it to understand or the failure is small, the more variability there is in failures. And when failures happen simultaneously, it's pretty much impossible to even comprehend what just hit you, right? To make things small and well-defined boundaries. Which is, which is another way of, way of saying, take a, take a big instrumental problem and break it down into small pieces, right? There you go. Yeah, right, exactly, exactly. So Jeff T, I want to ask you something. That map behind you, is that your failure domain? <laughs> Somehow it shows only Canada. <laughs> <laughs> no offense to our Canadian friends. <laughs> oh my goodness. So hey, I'm hey, doing my best to keep my failure domain small. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Listen, I, I, I just looked up clock here. It looks like we've got about uh, three minutes left. And, and um, um, so, uh, Maybe in wrapping up, uh, do you guys have any any last thoughts around uh, network complexity of with this horse to death? Uh, uh, yeah, issue obfuscation. <laughs> so I, I hope that almost five hours we spent together were useful to people who are listening to us. You know, we we are bringing together like eighty years of experience in networking and. Different places, right. different protocols, different deployments. So hopefully it's useful for you. We are open to questions either on YouTube or LinkedIn. Or you know how to reach us, right? We are still around, hopefully, for many years. And hit us with questions. We would love to be helpful and useful. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know. So, somehow, somehow Ixnan thinks you're younger than the rest of us, Jeff Doyle, because you've kept your hair. <laughs> I, I don't know if somebody asks, how did you keep, you keep hair? I have no, no idea. Just, just, just genetics. Yes. Wig. <laughs> yeah. And my well, family doctor used uh, to say at a certain age, your hair starts to grow inside. That's right. It turns in. And if there's nothing in there, it just keeps growing there and you go bald. Yeah, it, it's like it, you get you get fear and more of it growing out of your ears. Or yeah, so there's no secret for young younger listeners. Hair <laughs> doesn't go away; it just goes to your back. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I think uh, with uh, with that brilliance, I guess we should wrap it up. <laughs> I want to thank all of you once again, again for joining us and 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 sitting through through all of our game jokes, jokes to probably a few, a few a few nuggets. It's a wisdomly out of this, this. but uh, uh, before, before we adjourn, uh, 
we've got very exciting program for the next couple of months. A yeah, yeah. couple of new guests, mostly data center side, but very, very exciting, good speakers. So stay tuned. And uh, we plan to keep two weeks cadence at the same time. So it's more convenient for you. You can plan. Jeff, back to you. Yeah, yeah, right. I just I, I profusely thank you for the, the room has just been the most fun show, shows uh, that we've done, and and uh, we're going to be be thinking of future topics just to get you you back. Uh, maybe it's, maybe <laughs> well, it's around a lot of complexity. I don't know. Yeah, I'm always here, and both of you are welcome on the hedge any old time. You know, just shoot me topics. All right. All right. I love you, but you know that's right. Nothing new. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank, well, thanks, and and thanks everybody for joining joining us. And we will see we'll you in two weeks uh, uh, with a new topic, a new guest. guest. Uh, uh, not that you old guest rust rust, but uh, but we will def definitely be having you back. You back. So, in the meantime, have a good. Week.